Tonight, a WISN 12 News Commitment 2016 election special. The U.S. Senate debate in partnership with Marquette University Law School. Wisconsin's contest is one of the most watched in the nation. Republican incumbent Ron Johnson. That's what this election is about. This is about saving this country. Fighting to win a second term. Democratic challenger Russ Feingold. They want us to get to work on a bipartisan basis. I intend to win this election. I intend to start doing that in January. Trying to win back his old job. The outcome will help determine control of the Senate. Tonight, the candidates on health care, national security, and the top of their tickets. A 90-minute debate about the direction of the country. And now, live from the Marquette University Law School, here is tonight's moderator, WISN 12 News political analyst and upfront host, Mike Goucher. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to our debate with the candidates for United States Senate. We're joining you tonight from Eckstein Hall at Marquette University Law School, where I work as a fellow in law and public policy. During the next 90 minutes, we'll be hearing from the major party candidates for U.S. Senate. Incumbent Republican Senator Ron Johnson and his Democratic challenger, former U.S. Senator Russ Feingold. Our rules for tonight's debate are pretty simple. It's a conversation. I'll be asking the candidates about their views on important issues facing the state and the country. We've asked them to answer questions directly and concisely and to stay on point. No filibusters. The candidates can talk to one another, but I'll be managing the time on any given topic and we'll have the freedom to move the conversation along. Toward the end of our broadcast, each candidate will be asked to make a closing statement. So we have a lot to get to tonight. And the first question goes to Senator Johnson. Senator, thanks very much for being with us tonight. And the same to Mr. Feingold. Good to have you nice both with us. Same question for both of you. And, and I think this is safe to say that this race, as well as a number of races, has been somewhat overshadowed by our presidential contest this year. So let's begin tonight by giving the people at home and the people in this room uh, your take on what's at stake in this U.S. Senate race. Well, first of all, I want to thank Marquette University and WISN for, for hosting this debate. Uh, what I think is at stake is literally the future of this country. Uh, literally what haunts me is President Obama, right before he got uh, elected, he said, in five days we're going to fundamentally transform this nation. Now, Mike, I'm chairman of the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs. I, I could depress the audience here listing all the challenges, the problems, the threats that face this nation. Uh, we've, we've got to address those. We have to admit we have them. We have to fix these problems. Uh, but fundamentally transform America, that's not what we need. What we need to do is re return to our founding principles of a limited government, a government that's primarily designed to protect our individual liberty and freedom. Return to the benefits of a free market competitive system that guarantees three things, the best possible price, the best possible quality, the best level of customer service. I come from the private sector. I had to compete. Now, trust me, I would like, love to be a monopolist. So we have to understand what made this country great. It's the American people. It's the folks of Wisconsin that are wake up every day, work hard, create products and services we all value, and they need to be left alone as much as possible. They need to be able to keep as much of their hard-earned money as possible. That's what made this country great, not big government. Mr. Feingold, what's at stake from your perspective? Well, you know, I'm going to listen to the people of the state in all 72 counties last year and this year, and, and they told me what's at stake. I, I really see it as their decision what we should really be working on. And what I hear is that middle income and working families are wondering, when are they gonna get a little fairness? They feel like they can't pay their bills. Even though people at the top are doing extremely well, Wall Street's at the basically the highest point it's ever been. They know that unemployment is lower, but their wages are stagnant. And they're wondering, when are they gonna get a minimum wage increase? When are they gonna have paid family leave? When, when is, the cost of pharmaceutical medicine is going to go down. When are we going to do something about the student loan program? So what I see is at stake in this race is that I would stand with the people of this state who are concerned about that. And, and frankly, Senator Johnson has voted with the corporations and the billionaires and the multimillionaires who, who don't see it that way. So I, to me, that's a fair statement of the choice in this race. Does the presidential contest in, in your eyes, both of you, have any bearing on this race? First of all, I've got to refute what Senator Feingold just said. I've, I've listened to the false attack ads saying that I'm in the pocket of big business and I, I vote for corporate interests. Listen, Mike, I started out in my working career, buck 45 an hour as a dishwasher at Walgreens Grill. 
I'm proud of the fact that for the last 30 years before I became a senator, I helped start, build, and grow a very successful Wisconsin family business. I not only installed the equipment, once we had it installed, working with the, the millwrights and the, and the plumbers and the electricians, I operated the equipment on night shift, continuous shift operations. So the fact that Senator Feingold continues to attack me, and let's face it, his campaign has been primarily one of, of false attacks. I understand what it's like to work. You know, he says he's for the working men and women, you know, for the middle class. I am the working man. I've worked hard all my life. So the bottom line is, to answer your question, sure, I think the president's campaign will have an effect on this. But on the big issues, growing our economy, strengthening our military, defeating ISIS, securing our borders, appointing judges to the Supreme Court that have the integrity and fidelity to the law and the Constitution, I, I think we're on the right side of the issue. My, my hope is respond well, to that. You will. And my hope is uh, I'm going to say that we're going to talk about a lot of what you just mentioned and a lot of what you just mentioned. But go ahead. Yes. Well, you know, I'm confused. Well, why would Senator Johnson respond to what I said in that way? Because all I said was we have different voting records in the past, and uh, certainly his voting record is what I said: is he votes with those corporations, and he votes with the big business interests, and he votes against the things I talked about. This wasn't a a personal comment. It's something that the people of the state have a right to say. Who is this guy going to vote with? You know, is he going to vote with me or somebody else? That's the fundamental issue is who is the senator going to vote with? And I think I stand on firm ground that he votes with a big interest, and uh, I doubt that I would. Uh, you have uh, tried him uh, to uh, tie him uh, in some of your tweets on, on Twitter uh, to uh, uh, Donald Trump. Um, is that important in this race, or is he his own man? I don't know that I've tried. It's not very hard. I mean, let's face it. Senator Johnson is going to vote for and supports a man for president of the United States who just about everybody in their heart of hearts knows shouldn't be president of the United States. He's not qualified. He doesn't have the temperament. He's gotten where he is by dividing people against each other, saying very unfortunate things about Latinos and Muslims, and, and his personal conduct seems pretty inappropriate. So, you know, his colleagues in the Senate, some of whom are in some pretty tough races themselves, Republicans have said, you know, enough's enough. There comes a point. And they've, the senator from New Hampshire, the senator from Ohio, the senator from Alaska have all withdrawn their support. But Senator Johnson continues to take the irresponsible step of supporting him. But we need to do here what's best for America. And that means you put party aside, you put your own desire to get reelected aside, and distance yourself from somebody like Donald Trump, who certainly should not be president. Let me give you a chance to respond. To sure. That. Well, first of all, every vote I've taken, every the, the way I've conducted myself is always in what is in the best interest of Wisconsin and Wisconsin workers. You know, I'm, I'm beholden to no special interest. I'm the one that's announced this, this will be my last term. When I first ran in 2010, I said I would always tell you the truth, never vote my reelection in mind. I never intended to run for a second term, quite honestly. I was hoping to get a serious president to work with me, tell the American people the truth, address these problems, let me take the tough votes to fix these problems. That didn't happen. So I'm running again. I put myself in position as chairman of the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs to actually accomplish things. I've done a lot. I want to finish out that term as chairman, and I want to address these problems. So again, I don't know what Senator Feingold's talking about, nor does he, quite honestly. <laughs> but the, the fact of the matter is, I've got a real record of being independent and voting with the best interests of Wisconsin in mind. And, and by the way, coming from the private sector, I know how hard business is. I know how much harder the federal government makes it with the overregulation, the overtaxation. Senator Feingold voted in favor of tax increases 278 times during his 18-year career in the Senate. He's running for a fourth term. Is he willing to say that he's going to limit himself to four terms? Is it going to be five? Is it going to be six? I mean, come on. I'm the guy that is not worried about re-election. I'm the guy there that's seriously concerned about this country and willing to right. vote to solve these problems. Did, just just hang on one second. Good. Two quick <laughs> questions for each of you, and I want to follow up here. So uh, in the most recent Marquette Law School poll, 70% uh, of the people polled said that they did not believe that Donald Trump showed good judgment. So tonight, do you think your party's nominee shows good judgment? Well, certainly I'm not going to defend the indefensible. I've been very upfront when I disagree with the candidate. You know, I'm not sure that same thing can be said about Senator Feingold. I mean, he must be the only American who thinks Secretary Clinton is, is trustworthy. You know, we haven't even talked about her decades of corruption and lying, her dereliction of duty in Benghazi that cost four brave Americans their lives. And then, then when she welcomed the dead bodies back at the tarmac, she looked the surviving family members in the eye and li lied, bold-faced to them, and then take a look at her email scandal put America's top national security uh, secrets at risk 
because she's trying to avoid the, the, the FOIA laws, he has no problem supporting her. We should be asking him that question. Well, the, he will get a question here in a second. Do, do you think, as your party's nominee has said, uh, he says the election is rigged? Do you believe it's rigged? Do you believe there's widespread fraud? I think with the bias in the media, the deck is, cer the deck is certainly stacked against him, yeah. But no, I don't think the election is rigged. We certainly need poll watchers. I'm concerned about voter fraud. It does exist. I don't want to have any legitimate vote marginalized by a fraudulent vote. So I mean, that's, that's a legitimate concern. And it's definitely a legitimate point to talk about the bias in the media concentrating on all of his problems and completely ignoring, almost completely ignoring all the corruption, all the lies of Secretary Clinton. Mr. Feingold, uh, uh, let me ask you a question about your support of um, your party's nominee, Hillary Clinton. Um, you have said that she's reliable and trustworthy, and yet the same poll that I, I referenced just a moment ago showed 66% of the people in this state, two-thirds of the people in the state, do not think she's honest. How can you support someone that the people of the state fundamentally don't believe is honest? Well, Senator Johnson didn't talk about Donald Trump, so I'm going to talk about it. Can you talk about I can your talk about both Hillary Clinton without first. any problem. Senator Johnson completely pivoted away from talking about Donald Trump because he knows that it's wrong to support him for President of the United States. Senator Johnson is an excellent businessman. You know what? There's no way he would have ever hired Donald Trump at his business or ever let him run loose in his plastics manufacturing company because he's an irresponsible person who you can't deal with. So let me first say that you can't have it both ways. You can't say I'm for this guy and distance yourself. He's refused to appear with Donald Trump, although he still pretends that he wants to be. Now, let me answer the question about Hillary Clinton. I have had a number of experiences working with Hillary Clinton. It's a unique opportunity. I worked with her when she was first lady. In fact, I remember being with her here in Wisconsin, up at El Verno College a while back on the health care issue. I worked with her when she was in the Senate. And I also worked with her when she was Secretary of State. What I've said is that in each encounter I've had with her, she's been reliable and trustworthy. That's my experience. And I believe she'll be an excellent president. She's extremely well informed on both domestic and international issues. She has good judgment. She's tough. Lord knows she's not perfect. But on balance, she's about as qualified to be president so, of the United States so as do anyone. You, do you have any concerns about... The, the way she's handled the emails. You have any concerns when she speaks to a, a private group on Wall Street and says that Wall Street reform should begin with Wall Street, or that she favors open trade and open borders? Does that give you any pause? Oh, I disagree with Secretary Clinton on a number of occasions. I disagree with her on issues on uh, the Iraq War, where I opposed the Iraq War and she was for it. I disagree with her sometimes on campaign finance reform. We had different views. Uh, and I certainly think that her presidency should be one that is as open and transparent as possible. She regrets some of the things that she did with regard to this issue, and she's been open about it. Uh, she's not perfect, but she's so much better than Donald Trump, who, frankly, I think will destabilize the world. If they see this person become president, it will be very frightening to the world because they won't know what to expect from the United States. And that, that's sort of Trump's everything, if you will. I'll give you just a few seconds. Yes, sir. First of all, do you realize Secretary Clinton probably could not get a security clearance based on her extremely careless, I would call grossly negligent, I'd say unbelievably reckless behavior with those emails. She could not get a security clearance. I doubt if she was just a normal person. Of course, we have a two-tier system of justice right now. That's obvious by the fact that James Comey decided not to recommend indict or, or in, indictment. Uh, do you also realize that I don't think she could be confirmed for any position from the United States Senate based on what she did on those email scandals? And yet, Senator Feingold supports her for President of the United States. What the American people ought to be suspicious of is a former first lady who leaves the White House and says she's dead broke, and a few years later, her and her husband are worth tens, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. Senator Feingold has no problem with that, and what they also ought to be concerned about and suspicious of is a former United States senator who called himself Mr. Campaign Finance Reform, was all for you know, campaign, you know, clean, ca clean campaigns, and yet tried to, tried to outlaw political action committees from being involved in elections back in 1995. That's the first thing he did when he left office. Right. He set up three, camp, three political action committees, raised $10 million, quite, quite honestly, fraudulently uh, tried to raise money, said he was going to spend that on candidates, spent about 5% on candidates. The rest he spent on himself, his right. shadow campaign, his campaign in waiting, setting up a little money-making machine. Mike, he's talked quite a bit. A little money-making machine that he's raised all kinds of money, right. primarily outside of the state of Wisconsin, Okay, use that to attack me falsely, relentlessly. 
You know, it might be successful. Let's, let's hope not. Let's hope let's, Wisconsin actually understands how incredibly phony he has been on campaign finance reform. Let's have, and rem remember let's have him respond. Okay, thanks. Well, everything you just heard is simply false. The people of the state know me. They know that I'm an ethical person, and that's exactly how I've conducted myself. But we're talking about the presidency here. I don't know how we got off on this. We're talking about who should be president of the United States. If you care about your family, if you care about your kids, if you care about unity within this country, if you care about the world being a stable place, the only choice is to elect Hillary Clinton. And the idea that you would actually cause the leaders of China and India and France and Britain to say, what are we supposed to do with somebody that changes his mind every five minutes and has no qualifications, who actually enables Vladimir Putin? Senator Johnson is a supporter of somebody who has basically invited Vladimir Putin to mess with our, our, our domestic elections. This is far greater than any specific issue involving an individual. This do, has do to wanna, do with the security of the world. Do you want to respond to what he said about whether or not you've changed your position on, for example, campaign finance reform? Sure. I believe that uh, the entire system was gutted and changed by the Citizens United decision, which came in 2010. That decision allowed corporations and special interests to hide and use huge campaign contributions to overwhelm the political process. Senator Johnson loves that system. He actually uh, has four times more outside independent ads in his campaign than I do. So in the past, I was able to maintain a majority of my campaign contributions from Wisconsin. And now that is not the case because I believe the entire deal has changed. But ask yourself two questions. Who has more support from Wisconsin? I do. I have 50,000 Wisconsin con contributors or people from Wisconsin and over 110,000 contributions. He has said that he has 80,000 cont contributions from Wisconsinites, but he hasn't even revealed it. So let me finish. That, that's the first thing. That, 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 that for the Wisconsin support is far greater for me. Who has more support from outside? Senator Johnson has close to 11 to $12 million in outside attack ads, four times more than my campaign. So if the question is, who's, who's Wisconsin based in this thing and who isn't, clearly I am more so. Back in 1992 during the debate when he first ran, he said that he wasn't going to go to Washington and look for those PACs that outside money. He said he was always going to raise the, you know, the majority of his campaign funds right here in Wisconsin. And he said that was a pledge for the future. And then earlier this year, when you pressed him on that point, he said, no, that was a, that was a pledge for this term. What was it, a pledge for the future, a pledge for this term? And let's face it, he raised $10 million, spent it on himself, paid his campaign staff, his, his Senate staff, a campaign in waiting, paid himself a salary, bought leather-bound books <laughs> out of that, you know, didn't spend it on, on candidates. You know, so those, those are, that, he set up that exact, those packs that he actually tried to outlaw. But you know, what we're really talking about between Senator Feingold and Hillary Clinton, I think the American people are looking for dramatic change. You know, certainly our, no, our nominee is a change agent. I'm a change agent. If, if, you, if you want the status quo, if you think everything's just wonderful in Washington, D.C., you know, then you're probably going to support a 34-year career politician like, like Senator Feingold. If you actually want dramatic change, if you want to get our economy realizing its full potential, you, you'll actually elect people that know how hard business is, come right. from the private sector, gonna... and will actually change Washington. Yes. Mike, just like Friday night, Senator Johnson is saying things he knows not to be true. The fact is that the group that he's talking about, Progressives United, was created to fight the kind of corporate domination of our political system that Senator Johnson supports. It did many things. Yes, it gave some contributions to other candidates, but that wasn't the main purpose. The main purpose was to try to raise contributions through emails indirectly for candidates, which was very successful. And even more importantly, it was to make sure that tens of thousands of emails could go in, for example, when Social Security was on the chopping block in Washington. Progressives United was successful in raising the alarm. When interests of the type that Senator Johnson supports were trying to take away net neutrality on the Internet, this organization was effective. It was 100% ethical and effective, and all of the things he said about the personal benefit of it are completely false. But here's the point. He's trying to change the subject from what really matters here, which is that the families of this state want a senator who's going to vote for things like raising the minimum wage and doing something about the cost of pharmaceutical medicine. But instead, he wants to engage in these kinds of false. I'm going to get to a I lot can, of these I can, issues. I can, quickly, I can quickly in. close this out. His PACs were basically a little money-making machine, developing, spending money to develop a donor list, with, which then Progressives United sold, you know, check this out, 
to the Feingold campaign, which is why he's been able to raise all this outside money. His last report, 70% of his contributions coming from outside the state. You can be the judge. Do you, do you favor any changes in, in our current system, the way that campaigns are run, the influence oh, of we, money we, in we, our we campaigns? We should certainly try and get back to a system where the campaign contributions flow into the campaigns where they're accountable. Right. And of course, that, that was Senator Feingold's high profile, spectacular failure campaign finance reform. It was one of his plans that simply didn't work at all. A lot of it's been ruled unconstitutional, so I know he's got a lot of plans, but they simply don't work. It's a spectacular failure. The senator has been in office for almost six years. He has not lifted a finger, done anything whatsoever to try to change the campaign finance system because he loves it the way it is. He is benefiting enormously from this corrupt system, from these hidden contributions that aren't reported. He doesn't want to change it, otherwise he would have done something to do it. I worked on a bipartisan basis with John McCain to do something about it. And by the way, that law still stands. The main provision of it is politicians like Senator Johnson can't call up special interests directly and ask them for direct contributions. If we can overturn Citizens United, which I believe we'll be able to in the next few years, the McCain-Feingold law will again have the effect of preventing these kinds of corrupt contributions. And I think we should demand and I think Congress should pass a law requiring these disclosures. See, the Supreme Court said that we should know where these contributions are coming from. Senator Johnson doesn't support that. In fact, he compares it to the need of the NAACP to not have their memberships list revealed. Well, I'll tell you something. The people of this country and the people of the state deserve to know where all this money that's supporting Senator Johnson is coming from. It wouldn't be pretty. I, I want to move on to uh, uh, topics that both of you mentioned in your introductory remarks uh, to answer the first question. And, and it seems like there's a theme that, that we're going to talk about tonight, and it's security, a theme about security. There's national security, there's foreign policy, but there's also economic security. So let's walk through a, a number of these issues. Um, I want to begin by talking about um, economic security. And, and this is interesting. Six years ago, we sat in the same room at about the same time. The unemployment rate was 7.8%. Today, it's 4.2%. So clearly, the economy has improved from what it was in 2010. And yet, we see a recent survey by Marketplace and Edison Research says that people feel a growing sense of economic anxiety. We see a Marquette Law School poll that says 53% of the people uh, feel that they're either just getting by or struggling. So my question, I'll begin with you, Senator Johnson. Uh, give us a couple examples of things that you think people in the U.S. Senate can do to better the lives of those people who feel that economic angst. Well, first of all, they're feeling reality. You know, during the eight years of the Obama administration, wages have stagnated. We are still at a median household income that's below 2006, 2007 levels. So they're right to feel the pinch. You know, so yes, unemployment's lower, but so many people have dropped out of the workforce. Economic growth is the number one component of solution for all these problems. And let me show you why. If we go from 2% to 3%, by the way, this is the slowest recovery from the recession post-World War II. Last, last quarter was 1.8. 1.4 economic growth, first quarter was 0.8%. On average, since the Great Depression, the American economy has grown at about 3.2%. So it's an enormous difference. You go from 2% to 3%, that's $14 trillion of added economic activity in just 10 years. 2 to 4% is $29 trillion. Even with the meager economic growth we've had since 2009, federal revenue has increased by $1.1 trillion. So you have to grow the economy. So all of our public policy ought to be directed toward unleashing the innovation, the creativity of Americans. So we so can grow our economy. So what we need to do is we have to reduce the regulatory burden. You know, in my committee, by the way, we, we issued a, mission, a vision statement to enhance the economic and national security of America. One of our subcommittees was all about regulatory reform. It costs about $2 trillion per year to comply with federal regulations. Divided by the number of households, Mike, that's $14,800 per year, per household, to comply with federal regulations. So there's a big reason why wages are stagnated, so we need to reduce that regulatory burden. You know, what I'd ask the, the, the listeners in the audience is, would you rather have that $14,800 feeding a massive, inefficient, ineffective government bureaucracy, or in your paycheck, feeding and providing for your family? So Senator Feingold supports the growth of those regulatory agencies. He supports something like the waters of the United States, which would put the EPA in charge of 92% of Wisconsin landmass. That'd be devastating for our economy. So he wants to grow government, which is going to require more taxes out of your paycheck. I want to grow the private sector by reducing the size of government. I want to make sure that Wisconsinites get to keep more of their hard-earned money. What would you do to address some of that economic angst? Well, I, I, I think you deserve an answer. And you know, this sort of trickle-down approach that somehow if we just uh, grow the economy for those at the top, it's going to trickle down to those in the middle at the bottom. That isn't what's happened. 
And as I've gone to all parts of the state, people have told me, no matter if you're in Milwaukee or Chippewa Falls or up in Superior, they're telling me that hasn't happened. So what do we need to do? We need to do the opposite of what Senator Johnson has proposed. We need to increase that minimum wage substantially. It is at $7.25, which actually, if you have a family of more than one, if it's two or four family members, that's below the poverty level. Senator Johnson doesn't even support raising it from $7.25. In fact, he has said in the past that he doesn't even think that we really should have a federal minimum wage. Secondly, you ask for specifics. We need to have paid family leave for families. We need to make sure that when you have a child, you have an opportunity to have a few weeks off to bond with that child. I think that's better for the employer. We could join the rest of the countries in the world that do this sort of thing. That would make a measurable difference in a lot of young families' lives. Another specific. You know how worried the people of this state are, the older people in this state are, whether you're talking to them in Eau Claire or at Clinton Rose Center here in Milwaukee, they're worried sick about the cost of these pharmaceutical medicines. It's overwhelming. Sometimes people are, have a $400 dose and a person is tempted to cut that pill in half in order to, to, uh, to make sure they can st still pay their food and rent. Senator Johnson stood against, and with, he stands with the pharmaceutical industry, and I believe we should pass a law allowing the federal government to negotiate lower drug prices under Medicare. That would save the country $123 billion on all of these measures. You see he has zero specifics because he will only stand for those things that the right. corporations won't allow. So let me give you a specific. On your show, when you asked him about the minimum wage, his proposal would raise it to $15 an hour. You know, there are a number of studies that say that would cost the American economy six to seven million jobs. And Senator Feingold says, well, yeah, there'd be some dislocations. Well, that's a nice little euphemism for a father not having a job to provide for the family. So there's some very serious negative unintended consequences. And to, to your uh, allowing Medicare to negotiate prices, we already have that Medicare Part D, where you have a single-payer, government-run bureaucratic health care system like Senator Fongo wants for all of our economy, you know, for, for all of the American people. Like the VA health care system, they only have access to about 82% of drugs. Medicare at least has access to about 95% of drugs because we, they allow the different providers of Medicare Part D to negotiate those prices alone. CBO director says that that negotiation by Medicare would save negligible amounts of money. So the bottom line is what Senator Feingold is proposing is more government, you know, more plans that simply don't pan out, have ne very negative, serious, unintended consequences. Again, concentrate on some dislocations by raising the, the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I mean, that's unbelievably callous. I'll give you a couple you of quick seconds. imagine a senator who doesn't believe you should even have a minimum wage that comes up to the poverty level, representing the people of Wisconsin, and having him say that having uh, Medicare negotiated at the federal level for lower drug prices doesn't save money, it's an official estimate. $123 billion that it would save. And by the way, the senator has also voted to uh, open up that donut hole again. You know, he fought so hard to make sure that uh, seniors wouldn't have their gap in their coverage on their prescription medicine, he's voted to open up that donut hole again. What, what, what do you tell a senior in this state who's desperately scared about their prescription medicine? He just says, well, there's really nothing we can do about it. So, so Mike, let, let's talk about how we really need to grow the economy again. Because I've grown a business, you know, I've provided hundreds of Wisconsinites good paying jobs. I've taken zero income Wisconsinites and made them middle income Wisconsinites. You know, he seems to have a problem with that. I don't think anybody should apologize for working hard and succeeding. And how you succeed and how you grow an economy is, again, get the government out of the way. Reduce that massive regulatory burden. We have to have a competitive tax system. Right now, we do not. And Senator Feingold supports the policies of President Obama, who, as a candidate, said because of his policies, electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket. Now, he couldn't pass those laws through, reg uh, through legislation, so now he's passing those same policies through regulation, circumventing Congress. And so that's what we need to do. We need to reduce the regulatory burden, have a competitive tax system, and utilize our God-given energy resources to keep Wisconsin workers competitive. We all want to maintain a clean environment. But the fact of the matter is, is the policies that Senator Feingold promotes, that makes Wisconsin workers less competitive. That's what, in effect, makes global competitors more, com more, more competitive and costs us jobs overseas. Very, very quickly. Yeah, let's be very clear. This is a very simple statement. Senator Johnson paid himself $700,000 for 10 years for his time at his company after he went to the Senate. And he described that as reasonable. He doesn't think raising the minimum wage from $7.25 is reasonable. Every Wisconsinite should see that. Let me ask you... Uh, I, I, I do, need, yeah. do need to respond to that. Again, nobody should apologize for working hard and succeeding in the American economy. 
I'm proud of the fact that I worked with some great people at my company, built a great business that provided all those good paying jobs. I mean, that's just a fact. That was 13 years where I didn't take a salary. I left the money build in the business so it would build, so it creates some additional jobs. I don't, it's sad. The Senator Fine, he says he's fighting for the middle class. Well, my business provided great paying jobs, careers. Some of those people are still with me after 30 years. I don't know why he has a problem with a successful family manufacturer that exports all kinds of different countries. Again, I don't think anybody should have to apologize for working hard and succeeding. Nobody has a he, problem. He, he, he apparently seems to do that. And by the way, I have never suggested we do it with the minimum wage. I would be happy to look at reasonable proposals for indexing it to inflation. I'm just not supportive of dramatic increases that actually cost families, jobs, and opportunities. And he's for that, and he just calls that dislocation. And nobody said anything cents. about your business or who you hired. All I said was, you won't even raise the minimum wage one nickel. I just said, I'd be, how, I, I just said I'd be willing to do it on an indexing basis. I'm just oh, not willing well, to go to $15 an hour, which would cost the American well, economy your six position, to seven million jobs. You have voted consistently against raising it at all. That's the record. That's the fact. That's what the people of Wisconsin need to know. I want to ask a question that's, uh, uh, I think, um, of interest to some of our students in the audience tonight. It is about um, the affordability of college. Uh, uh, Mr. Feingold, you've, you've talked about the need to allow students to refinance uh, their loan debt. Uh, you've also talked about having free tuition for uh, families making uh, under $125,000. Briefly, uh, the first question, why, why do the student loans need to be uh, uh, tackled? Well, it's a crisis, and uh, everywhere you go in the state, if you want to hear one issue within the context of the cost of living, the problems of live, making a, a living, the thing you hear most is the, the frightening aspect of student loans. You know, the average uh, student coming out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, with student loans is about $28,000 in debt. So half of them come out with no debt, and half of them, half come, of them out come out with, with an 28, average 000, of 28. 28,000, and many other people come in with much more. Now, this is very expensive, and I have held uh, town meetings and roundtables with students all over the state who tell me that this is very disturbing. Senator Johnson says they think it's free money. Well, no, they don't. They think it's very disturbing, and it's a terrible way to have to start their life. And, and the, one of the young women here at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee actually said to me, Senator, you have to understand that sometimes when you go out on a first date, this is what you talk about. And I like to say, well, they deserve a better icebreaker than that. Mm -hmm. But you see, that's no way for a generation to be treated. Senator Johnson doesn't respond to that. When Elizabeth Warren had a straightforward bill that would allow the renegotiation of interest rates uh, like you can do on a mortgage, he voted no. It was very close. I think they were within a couple of votes. He prevented it. That is something that people really want. I also do believe that we should have a goal of making it that people can graduate from college at least debt-free when it comes to tuition. And that is something that I'd like to see more. How do we pay for that? We've got a, a $19 trillion debt. Uh, we've got increasing pressure uh, because of our aging demographics on Social Security and Medicare. How do we pay I'll for free how. college tuition? I've offered a federal fiscal fitness plan that has up to a trillion dollars in pay for us. That's what a senator should do. Senator Johnson Explain talked... Explain what a pay-for is. A pay-for is where you is. close a loophole like the carried interest at $16 billion over 10 years, and you use it for something like student loans or to reduce the deficit. Senator Johnson doesn't do this sort of thing. What he does is simply talk about how much the debt's going to be in 30 years. I've offered a specific plan that's all about closing the kind of corporate loopholes that he's voted for, cutting spending, as we did on prescription medicines. The job of a senator isn't just to say the system's bad or to propose send, uh, spending. It's to say, okay, this is how we should pay for it. I've done the work of specifically proposing what we would do he has not done essentially any of it. Let me give you a chance to respond to first the, the student debt question sure. and, well, and the other things. It's all about here. college affordability. And, of course, Senator Feingold's Exhibit A on why college is so unaffordable. He, he was paid $150,000 for 19 lectures. That's almost $8,000 a lecture, lecturing Stanford out in California. So when colleges have that much money to, to pay a guest lecture, you understand why the college cost of college has increased at 2.6 times rate of inflation. So I just ask people, what is so different? about what college and education spend their money on, that the cost would increase at 2.6 times rate inflation. Well, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York gives us the answer. They said because the federal government poured money into higher education, into a limited supply. For every dollar the federal government poured in, in student loans and grants, tuition increased by 65 and 55 cents. Do the math on that, it was about $2.1 trillion. 
That's, you know, times about 60%. That's $1.3 trillion, which just happens to be the amount of student debt that's outstanding. So the federal government, with the best of intentions, had the very negative unintended consequences of making college much less affordable, making it much less accessible. So the solution is, is drive competition and drive productivity into education. We are still largely What does that look like? Productivity, utilizing technology. We're still operating our college and universities, NK through 12, basically on a 19th century model. We have an explosion of the information age, of computers, of technology, of best practices, and we simply don't utilize it. Before I became a senator, I was really involved as a volunteer in education in Oshkosh. We did something with the Catholic school system called the Academic Excellence Initiative. How do you teach more, better, easier? In other words, educational productivity. At the time, I typed into my Yahoo search, educational pro productivity. I didn't misspell it. I got zero results. So what we need to do is we need to drive a democratization of technology into higher education, things like massive online open courses, promote those things, move toward away from a, de a degree model to a cert certification model. And here's an example. I don't care how you got educated to be able to pass a certified public accounting test. It's not an easy test, but if you can pass it, you're, you're a CPA. So if we do that, you'd put a lot of competitive pressure, you'd find all kinds of innovation. We're already seeing it, things like the Khan Academy, there's, there's a bunch of innovation, but because you have the higher education economic cartel, we're not seeing those types of advances in productivity and education, which is why you see college so unaffordable. And again, let me remind you, $8,000 a lecture, okay. that's not exactly we're, we're what I'd call reasonable it. compensation. We're going to talk about that right now because um, Senator Johnson's most specific idea about higher education was that we should get rid of professors that and just, put, I'm going to finish, and put in uh, Ken Burns tapes on the Civil War and have proctors apparently poke people uh, in case they don't sleep. But let's talk about something else. He's talking about how I was paid as a professor. You know what he's talking about, Mike? He's talking about this school. He refuses to acknowledge that I taught here at this wonderful law school for a year. I was paid the same way. And you're calculating, calculating it the same way. He's demeaning the work of this wonderful faculty here that I had a chance to be a part of. Professors aren't paid by the class time alone, but that's the game he's playing. It's not honest. And let me finish, please. The other day I was in Wausau and I had a chance to do a nice uh, press conference on my ideas about Social Security and Senator Johnson's desire to privatize Social Security. Awesome. And afterward, a young man walked up to me. His name's Kurt Ellison. He said, Mr. Feingold, you taught me at Marquette. And I now have my own law firm here right across the street from City Hall. You know what? That young man was one of the smartest students here. He was magna cum laude and on the law review. That's what I was doing, teaching. Senator Johnson demeans higher education. He demeans the professors. He's pretending that what they do isn't real work. And I think he should be ashamed of it. I'll give you 30 Mike, seconds. We'll wrap up not, this conversation. There are not enough minutes in this debate for me to refute all the false charges and attacks of Senator Feingold. The Ken Burns tapes was an example I was using of that academic excellence initiative for high school. Now, I was not even coming close to saying we should replace teachers. What I said is teachers should use that excellent documentary. It's an excellent documentary. It's called technology. Utilize that as a best practice way of teaching the Civil War and then have the teachers proctor, not poke students, proctor <laughs> that type of stuff. So again, it's about actually using a business person's approach, innovate, productivity gains, you know, actually utilize technology to lower the cost. That's, that's, that's what I certainly experienced in the private sector. I had to compete. Because I had to compete in this, this marvel we call the free market system, my prices were a lot lower, my quality was higher, as was my level of customer service. Wouldn't we love to have that in healthcare? Wouldn't we love to have that in education? The problem is we've driven those free market disciplines out of those two areas of our economy. And of course, all Senator Feingold wants to do is grow government, impose more government control over those things. It simply won't work. It, I'm talking about things that will actually work. You brought up health care, and I, I do want to spend a couple minutes on, on the Affordable Care Act uh, on, or Obamacare, depending probably on your political point of view. Um, and and uh, I'll begin with Mr. Feingold. We, we talked about that a fair amount six years ago. We're still talking about it today. You have been a strong defender of your vote in favor of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and yet some of the criticism now has come from 
Democrats. You've got former President Clinton who said, uh, you know, I, I like the idea of Obamacare. I was in favor of the law, but this is the craziest thing. People who are small business owners or don't make, a, make enough money to qualify for a subsidy, they're getting killed by rising premiums. You heard the governor of Minnesota, Mark Dayton, a Democratic governor. They have their own Affordable Care Exchange there. He said the Affordable Care Act is no longer affordable. Would you concede that it has not worked exactly as you envision? Well, I think it's essential that you make sure that everybody in this country has health care and that it's affordable and that it's accessible. That's the goal. That's the thing I most heard uh, when I was a United States senator and did town meetings. That's what people wanted. That was their number one request. And what the health care reform bill did was some very important things that we would not want to give up. Senator Johnson wants to completely repeal it. If he had his way, we would be in a situation where the 20 million people who are now covered because of the successes of the health care reform bill would no longer be covered. And by the way, that saves a lot of money through the system. Ask the hospitals. Ask the clinics. Not having people coming in sicker is one of the best ways to save money through the system. Secondly, if Senator Johnson has his way and repeals it, we'll once again have a situation where people can be denied insurance based on a pre-existing condition. And that means cancer people, health, uh, heart condition people, and others. And if Senator Johnson has his way, young people who are graduating high school won't be able to stay on their parents' plan until they're 26 years old. So those are all things, obviously, I think are successes. But moving forward, yes, we have to work on a bipartisan basis to figure out how to make it better. For example, there's a family glitch problem where the evaluation of eligibility is based on an individual rather than a family. We need to get rid of the uh, so-called Cadillac tax. We need to do something to deal with the cost of prescription medicines. And we do have to figure out a way to control deductibles, because this is the greatest concern I've heard. Right. But that can only happen by, a, by conceding that the law is here to stay, which it is. But Senator Johnson, he wants to go back six years, get rid of the whole thing, and start over. And you know what? That won't work. It's time for us to work together on a bipartisan basis to make it more affordable. That should be the goal. I want to give you a chance well, to respond. Please. Let me just frame it this way. Because, well, I mean, because, he's, he's oh, no, spoken get, a lot, yeah. lot, lot, lot well, long, long time on, on the subject. And I'll give you plenty of time to talk about it. But I was just going to say, the other night, you, you referred to Obamacare as a massive consumer fraud. Yeah. And my question is essentially this. Is, is there value in having 20 million people, or that number, insured today who were not insured well, in 2010? First of all, in Wisconsin, I almost misspoke yesterday, or on Friday. Friday. Before the Affordable Care Act was implemented, 94 percent of Wisconsinites were insured. Now it's 95 percent, so it's gone a little bit higher. Two hundred. It, 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 it has been. It is. It has been. It has been a. It has been a disaster. I've got Gina Sell here in the audience. She's a young mom, who had to quit her part-time job, leave her kids, get a full-time job because her premiums went from $500 a month to $1,200 a month. The Patient Protection Affordable Care Act has not lived up to its name. There are three basic promises. And Senator Feingold made a couple of these. He wrote an op-ed said there's nothing in the health care law that will force you off an insurance plan you like. He said premiums would be reduced. Like, Senator, like President Obama said, that if he passes health care law, premiums that families will pay would be reduced by $2,500, up to $2,500 per year. If you like your doctor, you can keep it. Well, none of those things have turned out. The fact of the matter is, is thousands of Wisconsinites lost their health care plans they could afford. Senator Feingold said he knew what was in it. Well, he should have known that Obamacare basically eliminated the high-risk pools. That's 20,000 Wisconsinites right there that he had to know were going to lose their plans, and yet he promised Wisconsinites, if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. It was a mass consumer fraud. Of the, three, of the six demographic groups the Manhattan Institute has studied, the lowest cost increase on individual plans is from one to 1.8 times. Now, in other words, they're paying 1000 bucks. now they're paying $1,800, the, the highest is 3000 from $1,000 to $3,000. This, you, you bet I'd go back. If, if we could cut premiums to a half or to a third of where they are today, yeah, I'd go back, and then I would actually work toward free market reforms, patient-centered, put patients back in charge, give them the freedom and the choice to choose what health care plan as opposed to impose on them this completely unworkable system that is literally in its death spiral right now. You know, the, the real fraud here is to pretend, as Senator Johnson is doing, that there wasn't a problem with premiums and deductibles before the Health Reform Act. Obviously, there was. In a lot of cases, uh, insurance companies are ripping people off right and left. The idea that somehow this started in 2011 is ridiculous, and he knows it. The fact is that we have an opportunity here to broaden this coverage, which will be better for everybody. 
Senator Johnson, just as he does in the minimum wage, he won't raise it a nickel. He won't help out with student loans. He says that 200,000 Wisconsinites getting health care coverage from the health care reform bill is just a little bit. It's not for them. Senator, you may have health care coverage, but those 200,000 people didn't have health care coverage, and you just dismiss it we, we as it's have, nothing. It's very significant. We could have easily covered those people without having to completely remake our insurance market, without completely remaking the whole health care delivery system. It's been a disaster. And on your show, Senator Feingold, and here's a quote, the health care law really isn't as bad as some people are pretending it was. Trust me, Gina Sell's not pretending. Janice Fenneman, whose premiums went from $276 a month to $787 a month, is not pretending. The couple with cancer, she was stage four lung cancer, he with prostate cancer, who lost their insurance on the high risk plan, called me panicked because they couldn't log on to healthcare.gov, a big government website. Couldn't, couldn't even set up a website, spending about a half a billion dollars trying to do it. They were in a panic. Stress when you have cancer is not a good thing. That was the result of his health care plan. And yes, you bet I would repeal it in a heartbeat. And again, concentrate on what would actually work. Interject free market disciplines, things like health savings accounts, allow states to regulate, to define insurance, allow people to purchase insurance across state lines. You could handle the, the, the pre-existing conditions using high risk pools, reinstate those things. There's all kinds of things we do. Didn't have to spend literally trillions of dollars on this Rube Goldberg scheme that is a complete disaster and actually is harming real people. Senator Feingold, they are not pretending. Look, what he's going to do if he has a chance is repeal this. Yes. And what he just said was, it's a lot of stress when you have cancer and you can't get health care coverage. Well, he's going to eliminate the provision to make sure you can't be denied health care coverage based on a pre-existing condition. He's going to stress out a whole lot of people. I want to ask you uh, each a question about uh, trade. And, and this has uh, become a big issue in this race. Um, um, in the presidential contest, it's been, become a big issue. Um, and I want to ask this a little differently. So we're talking about the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Act. This is something that President Obama favors. He thinks it'd be a good idea to open up markets in the Pacific Rim nations, 12 countries, not China, but 12 countries. And he thinks it'd be a good idea. Um, when you announced your candidacy, Mr. Feingold, you said right off the bat, this is a long, complex agreement. You said right off the bat, I'm against it. Why are you against it? Well, first of all, anybody that's been following this subject over the years, as I've had an opportunity to do all the way back to NAFTA, knows that these agreements all have a common characteristic. They're corporate handshakes. These aren't legitimate deals between countries where workers and other concerns are represented. They're done in secret, and they always benefit the big corporations. NAFTA and the other agreements have cost Wisconsin 75,000 jobs over the years. That's certified by the government. That's so it's not automation, it's not companies picking up and moving to the Sun Belt because what of I just said was laws. those 75,000 were certified by the government to have been related to trade because otherwise you can't get the TAA benefits. So there, there may be others, of course, uh, that were affected by what you've just mentioned, but that's specific to trade. So the TPP, there was tons of publicity about what was going on in those negotiations. There were protests in countries around the world. And without a doubt, I could see this was the same kind of thing, a deal that says, to our companies here in the United States, why don't you move somewhere else where there's lower wages, you don't have to pay the workers a, a, a fair price, you don't have to file the, follow the environmental regulations. And Senator Johnson has refused to even tell his position on it. You think about that. He's a senator from this state. He's had access to it till last December, and he says, you know, it's really complicated. I just can't come up with a decision until after the election. Well, again, he stands against the workers of this state, who I know have figured out that these trade deals, trade deals are a raw deal, and their senator has supported them every chance he's gotten. Senator. So unlike Senator Feingold, I actually know what I'm talking about when it comes to trading and exporting products. You know, I've, I export to 20, 25 different countries. So what will always guide my decision on any of these trade deals is what's in the best interest of Wisconsin workers. And it's vitally important that we keep overseas markets open to our agricultural products and our manufacturing products. So you're right. Senator Feingold, knee-jerk reaction, said no. I actually went through the very thoughtful process, the hard work. He says he listens to people. He's not listening to anybody on this one. I'm actually reaching out to the very complex businesses in agriculture, in manufacturing. And how does that very complex deal, over 6,000 pages, affect their very complex business? The fact of the matter is with both president, presidential candidates against this, Paul Ryan, uh, having serious reservations, it'll probably never come up for a vote. I'm happy to let the next president negotiate a better, a fair trade deal. Happy to do that. 
But I also understand it's in the best interest of Wisconsin workers to keep those overseas markets open. And in order to do that, you're going to have to negotiate trade deals. But I am going to insist on fair trade deals. And there's no doubt about it. We've been taken advantage of. You know, Donald Trump is actually right on that. And so we've got to make sure that that doesn't happen in the future. So I'm happy to support a, a, a new president negotiating a better deal. But we've got to keep those overseas markets open. Uh, Senator Johnson has called these deals creative destruction. This is the first we've ever heard of, of admitting that there might be a little problem with what's happened. And unfortunately, he's doing what a politician does. It's a pure political ploy. The other senators around the country, people like Rob Portman, who was one of the leading advocates of trade, has come out against this deal. I think Roy Blunt in Missouri has come out against it. Senator Johnson is hiding because he's worried about his reelection. He will not tell us where he stands. It's just a game. I'll it's a political final, game. Final word on this. Well, again, I'm doing the hard work. It, before, before, and again, it's going to be a close call because we have to keep these overseas markets together. You know, one of the things I do do, and I've done this repeatedly, is I'll bring in people from the opposing views, bring in the unions, bring in the agriculture interests, the manufacturing interests, and find out where it is. But again, we're a long ways from that. So yeah, I'm not gonna make a snap judgment like Senator Feingold did based on a 60-page WikiLeak version of this thing. How incredibly closed-minded is that? Does, again, he does not understand the private sector. He apparently doesn't understand how important Overseas markets, being able to export our agriculture and manufacturing products are to the economy of Wisconsin. I want to spend a couple minutes on, uh, on the Supreme Court because uh, there are estimates that we could be talking about as many as three appointments to the court uh, for the next president. And I want to get a sense from each of you whether uh, there are certain things you absolutely must have or cannot have in a new justice. Senator Johnson, I'll begin with you. I, I only vote to confirm judges. Not liberal activists, not super legislators that uh, don't have the fidelity, the integrity to the written law and the written constitution. You know, people like Scalia. And the fact of the matter is, that's one of the, this is why this election is for all the marbles. This is for the presidency, this is for the Supreme Court. This is for Wisconsinites' Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms and be able to protect their families in their own homes. You have Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg crowing about the fact that the conservative majority has now been lost and she just can't wait. And the liberal wing, and of course, Senator Feingold voted for these, a lot of these judges that actually did vote against the landmark decision that made uh, the Second Amendment an individual right to keep and bear arms. They can't wait to overturn that Heller decision. But I'm concerned about First Amendment rights of freedom of speech, freedom of, of, of uh, religion. These freedoms are under assault. And so I will only vote, I will only vote to confirm judges people that have the kind of fidelity to the law that Justice Scalia had, when even in, for example, the flag burning case, where he was offended by the result, realized, no, the First Amendment trumps his own desire for a certain result. That's not what happens on the liberal wing, the super legislator wing of the, of the court. I won't vote to confirm those types of super legislators. He'll be voting for them all the time. Mr. Feingold? It's amazing that Senator Johnson would answer in that way when he has been a key part of denying the President of the United States his role in the Constitution to have an appointment considered. You know, I did teach a course here at Marquette, as you know, Michael used to see in the cafeteria line. Mm -hmm. The course was about the role of the Senate and the Constitution. Students were real good in understanding that the Constitution doesn't give the President and the Senate the option to deal with Supreme Court justices. It says the Senate shall advise and consent. The President shall nominate and the Senate shall advise and consent. Senator Johnson has refused to do his job, just like in the trade deal. He won't tell us where he stands. He said right out of the box, I'm just going to meet with the guy. I won't consider him. But he also said something else. He said that if Mitt Romney had run the election, it might be a different story. In other words, what he's pretending is that somehow it's about the next election, but the Constitution doesn't create a three-year term for the president. It's a four-year term. He has now broken the all-time record with his colleagues of not having a vote on a Supreme Court nominee. And the notion that I wouldn't vote for people that Republicans would want? When I was in the Senate, I did the opposite. President Bush had two nominations to the United States Supreme Court. I met with them for an hour each in my office. I did the four days or five days of hearings before the Judiciary Committee. And I made my judgment. I voted against one. And by the way, I voted for Chief Justice Roberts. And Chief Justice Roberts, Senator, voted on the right to bear arms decision, which I happen to agree with with Justice Scalia. So your statement about that is completely false. I gotta tell you, I think Justice Scalia, who the dean of this law school once clerked for, would be horrified to see the United States Senate doing this terrible damage to one of the most important institutions in our country. Constitutionally, scholar 
<laughs> full disclosure here, um, they're not required, are they, to hold hearings or to take a vote? No. They are they, it says they shall it's a political advise, process. They shall advise and consent. And so if they do not, as you can see the historical record here, it's, this is the most extreme politicization that has ever occurred. The longest was 125 days. They are, of course, required to take action of some kind. And all they've done here is just deny the president his ability to have a, a nominee considered. They can vote no, but he refuses to I, do I, that. I, 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 just, I, I, would, I would say Judge Bork was probably the most partisan. No, Mike, there are two co-equal branches involved in this process. Yeah, President Obama has the responsibility to nominate. The Senate's role is advice and consent. Now, our advice was, when we're so close to an election, let the American people have a voice in who should help, what the Constitution the court should be. So, and, then, uh, and then consent, you know, if I would have voted, I would have held, withheld my consent. I would not have voted to confirm Justice Merrick Garland because I know he is hostile you, to Second Amendment rights. But again, it's, it's certainly within the prerogative. We're fulfilling our constitutional role of advising President Obama not to send somebody up in such a politicized atmosphere. And it's certainly our it, constitutional role to withhold our consent. So is it, is it good for... America to have, and my, by my memory, I think Justice Scalia passed away in February of this year. Uh, the appointment came in, sure. or nomination came in March of this year. It's quite possible we could go another number of months before. Is that a good thing well, for listen, America? Listen to Justice Breyer, who's part of the liberal wing of the court. He said the Supreme Court's been operating just fine. If they deadlock 4 4, and that's quite honestly shows you the partisanship of the court, which is a real problem, that, that's a shame. So many of these decisions, if they, people really had the fidelity of the law, they should be unanimous. But if you have a split decision, the appellate court's ruling stands. So, no, it's, it's not, you know, Justice Breyer said the Supreme Court's operating just fine. This is not a constitutional crisis. It's not a crisis on the Supreme Court. I've been doing my job protecting Wisconsinites' Second Amendment rights because Justice Garland would definitely flip the court. You'd all of a sudden have a 5-4 liberal super legislator, liberal activist court, and that's something that de definitely does threaten your individual liberties, your freedom, your First and Second Amendment rights. Right. Final words. Imagine the founders of this country having somebody decide in advance here what Judge Garland's views would be, when not even giving him a hearing, not even doing the simple job of having a person come before the Judiciary Committee and having a hearing. Judge Garland is a very distinguished, moderate judge who many Republicans have voted for in the past for political reasons. Senator Johnson just said no because he is voting on the basis of ideology here and acting on the basis of ideology instead of following the Constitution. The Constitution clearly contemplates that he should do his job here. He sat on his hands, he's joined with others, and maybe he'll say it'll be fine when we go down to seven justices, maybe five. Maybe one will be enough because this process will not end. What's going to happen is Democrats will do it too, and you'll destroy the Supreme Court. I think this disqualifies him for this office on this ground alone. I'll give you a chance to respond to that. Well, that's absurd. Again, I am doing and fulfilling my constitutional role of advice and consent, and at this point in time, we're withholding our consent, allowing the American people in their votes. And let's face it, there's no guarantee that we're going to get a conservative uh, president who actually go through the list that, for example, Donald Trump has provided of judges uh, could be, go the other way. So again, the American people decide. I can't think of a more fair process from that standpoint. Again, no constitutional crisis, no crisis on the court whatsoever. It's pretty clear if he votes if Hillary Clinton's president, he's going to do the same thing. He's right. not going to let her have anything because he he does not have regard for her as president. He's going to disregard it. Anything? Oh, the, the, totally, okay. the, the totally different situation at that point in time. The American people have spoken. Now, I want to spend some time on uh, foreign policy uh, issues. Uh, I, I do want to talk about uh, what's happening uh, with ISIS right now. We're at this uh, uh, fairly important moment where Iraqi forces, with the help of American forces, are trying to retake the city of Mosul. So in the past, um, uh, I think we've all talked uh, about what is the proper role for the U.S. in trying to deal with the threat of ISIS. And, and I, w I do want to spend some time on that tonight. So, uh, Mr. Feingold, I'll begin with you on this. What, what is the proper role at this moment in time? Are we doing enough to defeat ISIS simply by using airstrikes or by using special operations forces to assist uh, Iraqi troops or coalition forces? Look, this organization is the most disgusting organization and has to be destroyed. There's no question. And although steps have been taken, I feel strongly that more has to be done. And that's why I've been specific, as you know, because I've talked to you about it before. A specific plan to enhance what's being done because some progress is being made but it needs to increase. We need to have special operations that already are existing that apparently got the number two guy in ISIS greatly increased. 
That has to be accelerated. I think it needs to be accelerated soon. And the only way that's going to work is if we have greater human intelligence, more spies that are on the ground in places like Syria and Iraq so we can identify where these people are. We have to be even more aggressive in cutting off their ability to have this sort of state or caliphate. And that means cutting off their oil supply, it's the ability to produce it and transport it. We need to cut off their finances. I worked on the Intelligence Committee for five years with the Treasury Department about the ways in which we can do that much more effectively. We need to make sure they can't get arms coming through the Turkish border. There's been some progress. The border's been closed up, as you indicated. There's been uh, land taken away from ISIS, both in Syria and now in Iraq. But we have to make sure that we do all of these things. And by the way, we need to do something else. We need to stop letting Saudi Arabia say they're our friend on the one hand, and on the other hand, export a Wahhabi ideology or religion that causes people to start believing that Americans are evil and should be killed. And Senator Johnson had a chance recently to vote for a resolution that would cause the Saudis to have to think twice before they got arms about some of the things they're doing. And he voted no. It was a bipartisan resolution, and he voted no. So I believe that these specific plans are necessary. Senator Johnson has no plan. He's well, the chairman we'll, of the we'll Homeland Security. We'll hear if he has a plan or not, and we'll, well give we know him a chance to, to answer the question. <laughs> well, first of all, you have to understand that President Obama laid out America's goal toward ISIS <clears throat> excuse me, over two years ago. It was defeated. And Senator Feingold's plan is, Senator, is President Obama's plan. It's not working. It's not anywhere close to adequate enough. And you don't have to just, you know, believe my word on it. Listen to CIA Director John Brennan, who testified before the Senate Intel Committee, I think in July, said that all of our efforts have not reduced ISIS's terrorist capability, their global reach. They remain a formidable, resilient, largely intact enemy. The fact of the matter is, Sami Mohammed Hamza, right here in Milwaukee, plotted to murder. He said he'd be 100% happy if 30 Wisconsinites, he was able to murder them. ISIS is a growing, evolving, and from my stand, standpoint, a more dangerous threat than it ever has been. And we have not been addressing it adequately. Now, so Senator Feingold, in, in his plan, in his plan, this is important to understand, in his plan are elements of things that he voted against during his 18-year career in the Senate. 11 out of 18 years, he voted against authorizing the top priority government, our military. Five of those years, the authorization was passed by the unanimous consent or by voice vote. He only twice voted affirmatively to authorize the Defense Department. That's where special ops are authorized. He's the only senator to vote against giving law enforcement the tools they need to combat against international terrorists. So he's got a very phony record when it comes to these plans and his support for their elements of his plan. What we need to do is we have to lead. We are hollowing out our military. We've got to strengthen our economy so we can strengthen our military. And then America's leadership is void in the world right now. President Obama and Senator Feingold have a plan. It's called peace through withdrawal. Do you realize he was the first senator to call for the strategic blunder of withdrawing American troops from Iraq as a stabilizing force? Now, that's not learning the lessons of history. When we left stabilizing forces behind in Germany, Japan, in South Korea, those were fabulous successes. We should have done that in Iraq. Because we didn't, ISIS was able to rise from the ashes of a, what was a thoroughly defeated you know, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And that's why we're having to deal with this right now. So again, we've got to strengthen our military. We have to lead a willing coalition. Do we need more to... American soldiers in that part of the world well, to defeat ISIS? First of all, we already have 6,000 American troops right now. That's the estimate. And those troops, probably, we'd probably have a stabilizing force, not in harm's way, had we left a stabilizing force. So what we are going to need is we're going to have to lead. We're going to have to provide air cover. We're going to have to get it right. I'm not saying this is easy. If we lead too much, everybody sits back and they don't join the coalition. If we don't lead enough, which is happening right now, they're not going to get involved to the extent we need to actually defeat ISIS. Mike, two years. That has allowed ISIS to train additional operatives, L wolf packs that are being directed, you know, little children to become savages and barbarians. That's what we have allowed to happen by allowing ISIS to exist for another two years. The plan Senator Feingold supports is not going to do the job. I'm, I'm going to try and cover just a, a couple more. Let me just respond. Yeah, very briefly, look, and I want to cover a couple look, more Senator points. Senator Johnson was asked to give his plan. He has no plan other than sending 100,000 troops, which he has said, and on occasion he I said know. sending 25,000. No, that's a not. coalition force, yes. I think. Yes. Coalition, he said that, coalition that, troops. He said 100,000, and he also said 25,000 Americans one time. He said 10,000. That's what he said, and that's his plan. I've got to tell you something. That's the same mistake we made when he went into Iraq. 
This is exactly what ISIS wants. Look, can you beat these, ISIS with, with airstrikes? Because you've talked about other things you said I, that could I, I be done, about, but can you beat ISIS with airstrikes? Not alone, and that's why I specifically told you the other things we have to do. And by the way, they are making progress. Tonight, our brave people from, from Iraq and others are actually in Mosul risking their lives. And Senator Johnson minimizes it as nothing. They are making enormous progress, but there has to be more progress. But he has said just last week, or two weeks ago, that he thinks we should send a force there for a generation. I want to tell you something. That is the worst possible idea. That is exactly what ISIS wants. He has not learned the lesson of the mistake of Iraq. That was a mistake, and I guarantee you, ISIS was created because we went into Iraq not because we left. Mike, I said the struggle against Islamic terror is a generational struggle. It's just true. I mean, ISIS, Islamic terrorists declared war against America, at least in the 90s when they tried bringing down the Twin Towers with a 1,300-pound bomb. So no, I didn't say this is, we're going to leave troops there for a generation, but it is going to be a generational struggle. This is not going to be easy, but we have to commit ourselves to success. We've got to defeat ISIS, then we've got to remain tenacious at tracking down Islamic terrorists wherever they reside and defeat them. Senator Feingold does, you know, he talks about human intelligence. The way you gather human intelligence is you capture these unlawful combatants and then you put them in a place like Guantanamo. He wants to close down Guant Guantanamo. So we don't gather that, that human intelligence. So, no, we've got to get serious about this. We're not. We, the, the longer we delay on this, the longer they're going to be able to train, the greater we are in peril. And, let's, and again, let me remind you, Sammy Mohammed Hamza, two Milwaukeeans were arrested in Texas trying to get to Syria. This is a real, growing, evolving, and metastasizing threat. Yeah, the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee here has had an opportunity to fight to raise the FBI's budget so they could get more agents. There is a proposal out there right now that would provide 225 counterterrorism agents. He hasn't acted on that. And they need those resources so they can do all these investigations. He has not acted in the way that he can, and that same thing goes for the intelligence budget, which needs to be increased as well. Mike, we are always fighting for more funding to defend this nation, defend the homeland. The problem is defend, funding, for example, defense. Democrats have held up defense appropriation bill because they hold it hostage for all the domestic programs, all these training programs, all these things that simply don't work. And that's been our conundrum. You know, we've got a divide in this country, and the fact of the matter is I'm there for prioritizing spending to the top priorities of government defending this nation, defending this homeland, Democrats, the allies that uh, the sign Feingold would uh, you know, end, in, end up in the Senate wanted to spend more domestically on domestic programs that actually in many cases do more harm than I, good. I want to ask you each about uh, what's going on in, in Syria because this is part of the conversation. We've all seen these, these terrible images from Aleppo, which has, has suffered greatly uh, with the war in Syria. Um, here's my question. Uh, your party's nominee, Hillary Clinton, has talked about uh, increasing the number of Syrian refugees allowed into this country, I think from 10,000 to 65,000. Do you favor that? Well, I think we have to play a role in having refugees in this country, but the scrutiny has to be very serious. And I think one of the things we can do if we actually increase the human intelligence budget in that region is we could learn more about these individuals before they come over here. I think we're sort of missing the boat on that. And with regard to Syria itself, I mean, the refugee thing is one issue, but the tra human tragedy there, what is happening with the Syrian government and the Russians is something that has to be addressed. We have to take more serious action. Senator Johnson has not provided leadership on this, and there are things we can do. For example, right. I have felt for many years that the moderate uh, groups there, the rebels, should be given some arms. There should be restraint about how you do it, but they could have anti-aircraft artillery given to them that would be helpful in deterring Russia and Syria from doing the horrible things they're doing in Aleppo. We could uh, cause the Russians to have more sanctions. Do you, not support, just the sanctions. 60, do you support 65,000 uh, Syrian refugees I don't refugees have a particular number that I'm interested in. I'm interested in proper scrutiny, and I'm interested mm -hmm. in making sure we know who these people are before they get here, instead of having to figure it out after the fact. I think you've said to me on, on my show that it's a pretty robust process, the screening process it is, for refugees. It is. No, so, no, 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 it's remain robust. So but, but, would but you again, support Mike, Mike, that? Mike, the events in Syria would not have spun out of control had we not done that strategic blunder of not leave a sta leaving a stabilizing force behind in Iraq. We wouldn't have seen the slaughter of close to a half a million Syrians had it not been for the fact that we withdrew from Iraq. We bugged out. So again, that is a problem and that's the bad judgment of Senator Feingold wanting to withdraw from the region. What we should be doing, rather than talking about bringing more refugees, let's, let's stop the refugee flow. Let's provide safe zones. Let's provide no-fly zones. Let's actually lead. And by the way, I was the U.S. representative of the United Nations General Assembly two times now, just most recently last September. And what I did is I met with delegations of 
the Arab states around the region, they are begging for American leadership. They say they will, they will follow. They will provide the ground troops. They will provide the, the boots on the ground to not only gain the territory, but then hold it. These would be Sunnis going to these regions. So it would completely change the dynamics on the ground. You might end up with a negotiated settlement. But unless America leads, provides the air cover, provides the, the no-fly zone, sets up the safe zones, we're not going to solve this problem. It's going well, to continue to spin out of control. I, you know, I understand he went up to New York once some meetings, but he's in the Senate. He's the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. Why hasn't he done anything I'm to create that no chief. Why hasn't he create, tr made proposals? You know, senators can make proposals, and they can propose a no-fly zone. They can propose arms for the rebels. The fact is, what Senator Johnson does is just criticize the president. That works really well. You just criticize the president, but you don't do your own job, which is to lay out legislatively what you need to do, provide the president with the authority to do some of these things, and maybe he'll use it or maybe he won't. But Senator Johnson is just talking about this. He hasn't acted. Mike, we're being word. blocked from bringing defense appropriation bills on the floor of the Senate where you could actually prioritize spending so you could offer amendments to do what Senator Feingold suggests. It's Senator Harry Reid, his minority leader, that is blocking that, that is being the partisan here. The obstructionists in the United States Senate right now are the Democrats. And that's why we're left with passing continuing resolutions, uh, ma massive omnibus spending bills, a terrible way to address government. We've been trying to bring appropriation bills before the Senate. We continue to be blocked. That's how you actually do this thoughtful prioritization. This so, so the b bottom line is they're the obstructionists. We've been trying to do this. I want to prioritize spending. And from my standpoint, I'm the guy in this race that understands that the top priority of government is defense of this nation. Senator Feingold is the guy that voted 11 times to authorize, against authorizing the military. Think about that. Let me respond to that. But first of all, this isn't about appropriation bills, Mike. Sure but this is. is about is whether he can even introduce legislation. Harry Reid can't stop you from introducing a bill. You haven't even done that. You haven't even introduced a bill to deal with this serious situation. And when he talks about these military authorization bills, everybody knows there's thousands of provisions in these bills. And by the way, on a number of occasions, I was not the only one to vote against that. A number of Republicans did, including John McCain, because it was loaded with pork and loaded with wasteful spending. And Senator Johnson said Friday night, was he always votes for the military authorization bill. Think about that for a minute. He's a United States senator whose job is to review legislation and see if it's loaded with all kinds of wasteful spending. No, he's going to vote for it for political reasons. Senator McCain and many Republicans make the military and all agencies justify their legislation. When it's good, they vote for it. When it's bad, they don't. But the idea that he's just going to vote for it no matter what is purely political. Our men and women are in harm's way, and you bet I'm going to authorize the military. I, I want to ask you a quick question as I look at the clock here, a quick question about Iran. Um, the two of you have very differing views on this, on, on the deal that uh, was made uh, um, by the Obama administration. It was a deal that was uh, designed to dismantle key parts of uh, the Iranian nuclear program in exchange for the lifting of sanctions. Uh, Senator Johnson, I'll begin with you. You think this is a big mistake. Why? It's a disastrous deal. Well, now, it, 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 it was designed to try and modify Iran's behavior, supposedly for the better. It's modified the behavior for the worse. They, we've emboldened the enemy. It is crazy to enter into a deal that injects $100, $100 billion plus into the economy and military of a self-proclaimed enemy, enemy of America and the largest state sponsor of terror. They are increasing their ballistic missile tests. You know, we, we, we can't even inspect. We were supposed to have any time, anywhere inspections. It wasn't part of the deal. That was a treaty. Advice and consent of the Senate, it was my amendment that would have deemed that a treaty so that United States senators would have stepped up the plate and said yes or no on a treaty. Had every senator upheld their oath of office on my amendment, in other words, to, defend, to support and defend the Constitution, their first duty to jealously guard their own co-equal power, of a co-equal branch power, that amendment, to deem that a treaty, should have passed 100 to 0. I didn't even get 40 votes. So the fact of the matter is, that is a disastrous deal. It has actually emboldened our enemy. What we should have done is ratcheted up sanctions. We should have actually brought them to the negotiating table so they negotiate in good faith. So we would have dismantled, I mean for all time, dismantled the nuclear weapon program instead of allowing them basically in about 10 years to be full force, uh, centrifuges spinning, weaponizing, and with ballistic missile technology. It's a disastrous deal. Mr. Feingold. Well, look, uh, there's nothing more important than making sure that Iran doesn't get a nuclear weapon. That is exactly what this deal was about. The sanctions that were put in place that I strongly supported 
were effective in forcing them to the negotiating table. And what happened at the negotiating table is we weren't just there. The Chinese were there, the Russians were there, and others were ready to participate in making this deal, which I believe is the best chance we have to make sure that Iran can never get a nuclear weapon, which is something we cannot possibly tolerate. And <coughs> Johnson, again, just like on the deficit issue, just like on the other issues we talked about, ISIS, he doesn't have a plan. He just wants to say, look, let's jack up the, the sanctions, but he doesn't have any specific idea about, it's not a plan because the reality is that what the sanctions are the things that actually got them to the negotiating table. I believe that this program is going to work. I believe that Iran is not going to be able to get a nuclear weapon because of this, because we'll have actual enforcement. And that's one of the most important things to do for the safety of the people of this country, but also the people of the Middle East and the state of Israel. And so, again, you can be negative, you can attack something in a partisan way, but across the board, I think most experts believe that this is a success. Uh, it has to be proven over time, but it was the right thing to do because we do not want Iran to get a nuclear weapon. Senator Johnson's alternative apparently would be to go to war, including also having the generational war in Iraq at the same time. I don't think that's a good idea. Again, you ratchet up sanctions to bring Iran to the negotiating table in good faith. And the goal of that negotiation been, should have been to dismantle the nuclear weapons program, like Gaddafi did in Libya. You do that peace through strength. We showed unbelievable weakness. It was a horrible deal. I, I just don't trust President Obama to negotiate a good deal when I want it came to, take, to Iran. I want to take, and again, Senator Feingold supports that disastrous deal. I, I want to take the remainder of our time uh, to talk about something that uh, uh, really directly affects the people of Wisconsin, and that is the opioid and hero, heroin uh, epidemic in this state. Uh, you can talk to law enforcement people and families all around this state, and they know someone who has suffered from this. They know someone who has fought addiction. They know someone who has died from their addiction. Uh, what is the role of the U.S. Senator in dealing with this? I'll begin with you, Mr. Feingold. Well, you have to acknowledge that it's an emergency, and that it is exactly what you just said, Mike. It affects every community in this state. Uh, poor, rich, doesn't matter. And so it's one of those times when you have to be willing to make sure that the resources are there. The resources have to be there for treatment. We have to make sure our doctors are trained and the Naxalone and other drugs are available for emergency situations. We have to make sure that we prevent it. That means making sure that there's resources to get intervention when kids are still in high school. We have to also make sure that these uh, big companies that have been pushing these painkillers have a little accountability. They have a responsibility here too some of these big pharmaceutical industries. This, didn't, this isn't you know, opium uh, addiction issues. This is people who begin taking these painkillers and then get addicted and then move on to other things. You know, when, when there was a chance to actually vote on this, $622 million in March, Senator Johnson had talked about the issue, and I give him credit for raising it, but when there was a bipartisan amendment to provide that funding on an emergency basis, he voted no and said we can't just throw money at the problem. We do need resources to fight this crisis. It is an emergency. It is at that level. Senator. Mike, we, we provided funding in the Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act, which I supported. Uh, this is actually one of the more disgusting false attacks that Senator Feingold has lodged against me in his, in his negative campaign. Um, the fact of the matter is my nephew died of a fentanyl overdose in January this year. We have held multiple hearings in my committee, four field hearings in, in Pewaukee, in Arizona, in Ohio, in New Hampshire, round tables. Uh, we have Lori Badura in the audience. She testified at that Pewaukee hearing. She lost her son, Archie. Uh, I've been active. I understand what an enormous challenge this is. You know, all of our work on, on figuring out why our border is so porous, it has to do with our insatiable demand for drugs and the fact that we let, allow all this heroin coming in, dra dramatically decreasing the price of heroin. So no, I've been at the forefront of this, and it was my prop act, pr promoting responsible opiate prescription, that Dr. Westlake at Pewaukee hearing said was probably the most important piece of legislation we needed to enact on the subject to prevent these tragedies. And it was so important that uh, Medicare actually picked up my prop act and uh, beginning to implement it through regulations because they have the regulatory authority to do it. So as, as the oversight committee, I will make sure that it is implemented, and what it does is it it no longer allows Medicare to reimburse based on a survey in terms of how patients view their pain management, which is given incentives for doctors to overprescribe opiates, which of course is one of the leading uh, gateway drugs to heroin addiction. So no, I've been incredibly active on this. The fact that Senator Feingold attacked me saying I'd done nothing on this, completely false. 
and quite honestly, a very disgusting false attack. I didn't say did nothing. I said well, you, you, there you, was you, a radio you, yeah. ad that the radio ad said that Senator Johnson essentially did nothing. It's well, the fact is that when he had a chance to vote for the funding that was needed, he didn't act. We voted and, he's for not, and he's not really talking about the fundamental issue here, which is people becoming addicted to painkillers. It's not about drugs coming over from Mexico. It's about the process where people start having painkillers and they become addicted and then they have to figure out other ways to, to deal with the problem. This requires resources that he was unwilling to vote for. That's based on his record. J just didn't offer as many resources as Senator Feigl would want. As you know, there, 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 there's, you know, I have yet to be in a Senate hearing where we're talking about a problem oftentimes exacerbated by government programs where the government witness where the solution wasn't another government program, you know, like another student loan program. We have 38 of those and more government funding. There is, there, quite honestly, that encapsulates the difference in this race. Senator Feingold is always going to have a plan that grows government, and I hope Wisconsinites are smart enough that when you grow government, government is going to come and take more money out of your pocket. I'm looking for solutions that actually work. I'm, I'm actually in touch with, I think, the real problems that, that Wisconsinites are facing. It's a lack of the type of opportunity. It's a slow economy. It's because of massive government overregulation, uncompetitive tax system. So I've been incredibly engaged on this, on this opiate issue. I will continue to be engaged. And I'm putting myself in position, quite honestly, as Chairman of Homeland Security, that oversight committee, to actually accomplish things. We passed 83 piece legislation, Mike. 20 had been signed to law. The PROP Act is one of them that's actually being implemented through regulation. I do want to follow up on something you just said. You talked earlier about the, the porous borders and that that was part of the problem, sure. in, in your opinion. So in our remaining time, why don't we segue right into that? What do you do about border security? Donald Trump says he wants to build a wall. Do you want to build a wall? What do we need to do? We have to end the incentives for illegal immigration, the number one being people coming to this country for work. So I was very upfront when I took over chairmanship. My concept of border security bill would have a robust guest worker program pretty well governed by the states. You know, they can set how many people have guest worker programs and they set the prevailing wage rates in different industries so we don't depress any American or any, any Wisconsinites wages. It's a common sense approach. Once you eliminate that incentive, you've got a whole, you know, got a whole lot less number of people coming to this country illegally that's going to be easier. You need better fencing. So, so, in so many areas, our fencing a is wall? a joke. You need a wall? You need better fencing. No, I don't think you need a 1,700 mile wall, but you can use technology. We probably need more boots on the ground. But what we need is a commitment by the commander in chief, by the president. And we haven't had that on a bipartisan basis. We have to commit ourselves. And Mike, we have to secure our border, not just only to fix the immigration problem, but public health, health and safety. Because our borders are so porous on this issue, do you realize a gram of heroin in the 80s cost about $3,200 a gram? Now it's about $150 a gram. 10 to $15 a hit is a very affordable addiction because our borders are completely porous. Mike, the problem here is that there's no real disagreement about the border issue. The problem you here is You think we need greater security yeah, on the border? I'm sure we do, but I voted when I was in the Senate for 900 more agents, and I would certainly have no problem with that. The issue here, Mike, is what we do about the 11 million undocumented people that are here in this country. We need comprehensive immigration reform. And Senator Johnson has used the excuse of only dealing with the border issue to avoid dealing with that, that problem. But you know what? That's bad for the families. I was just up in Green Bay the other day. A group of Latinos that I met with talked about how scary it is to try to go to work at some of the companies there because they can't get a driver's license. It's very bad for them. But you know who else it's bad for? It's bad for our, our business climate. The businesses in this state strongly want comprehensive immigration reform. The dairy farms in this state desperately need a legal status for these individuals. But Senator Johnson, again, hasn't lifted a finger. In fact, he said, we can't do that until we close the border. Now, you're never going to 100% close the border. But this is one of the most important issues of our time. It is a bipartisan issue. Uh, President Bush acted on it. John McCain, even Marco Rubio for a little while was working on this thing. But when he came in with the Tea Party, they just shut it down. So one of the most important issues to the economy of the state of Wisconsin, for the jobs in the state of Wisconsin, is comprehensive immigration reform. And he has stood against it and only talked about the border. I find that troubling. The, the question is, what do we do about the 11 yeah, or 12 again, million and, people and in the country? And the incentives for illegal immigration. The reason I vote against a comprehensive bill included $260 billion of benefits for illegal immigrants. That's called an incentive for illegal immigration. You have to end those incentives. You know, my guest worker program, that would actually address the people in this country, in Wisconsin, milk and cows. You know, so again, I've got a very practical approach. And the reality is, until you secure the border, you're not going to have the public uh, willingness 
to accept uh, some kind of legalization. I'm happy to do that. Once we secure the border, we will treat the people that are not committing crimes, that aren't gangs, that aren't feeding off our wealth, welfare system, we'll treat them with real humanity. There's no doubt about that. Again, that, 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 that'd be my proposal. But again, a, a comprehensive bill that offers $260 billion of, of uh, benefits to illegal, illegal immigrants. And by the way, when Senator Feingold had a chance on Social Security to make sure that illegal immigrants wouldn't get Social Security benefits, he, he basically voted to table that amendment that would have prevented exactly that. So again, he's, he would continue these incentives for illegal immigration, no, of course, and that's, that's, false. The, that's the first thing we have to Mike, do. Mike, that is false. It's been proven to be false no. repeatedly. But again, no effort by Senator Johnson to work with other senators on a bipartisan basis for comprehensive immigration that's reform. False. He, just finds, well, he just finds a flaw and says, well, I can't vote for it. Where's his leadership? He's the chairman of the committee. We, Why we, hasn't he introduced a comprehensive bipartisan bill to allow some kind of a solution to make sure that the 11 million people here have a legal status, pay some kind of penalty, get in line for citizenship. That's what the manufacturers and leaders in this state actually want, but he won't act on it. I have been acting. I've been taking a step-by-step -step approach. For example, we passed the Border Jobs for Veterans Act, killing two birds with one stone. I passed the Border Metrics Bill, which is the first step. If you're going to secure the border, you need the metrics, and we don't have them now. The problem is this administration only will secure the border with a comprehensive approach. Well, the comprehensive approach isn't going to work. We had comprehensive health care reform. Look at what a disaster that is. So I, as a manufacturer, I'm into continuous improvement. I don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. And again, you don't pass 83 pieces of legislation, 28 being signed into law, without an incredibly bipartisan approach. That's been my record. So again, his, his false attacks on me are simply that. They're untrue. I want to give you about 30 seconds. want bipartisan comprehensive reform and immigration. The only chance they have is to have a, a different senator because he will never work for comprehensive immigration They want reform. a secure border first. Is it possible, and, and I've got 15 or 20 seconds, is it possible to do a comprehensive plan or do you have to do it piece by piece just no, given no, the... There's no question. It was almost done uh, earlier by the bipartisan efforts that were made in the 90s. It was also almost done uh, with a, a combination of Marco Ruby and some of the other senators. He didn't participate with that group. He wanted to block it. But I don't think, I, actually, I think that's what will happen. I think this election will create a different Senate, a different president, obviously. And I believe that there actually will be comprehensive immigration reform because the business community, yeah. those what, what, who create jobs in this country, yeah. want this done. In my hearings on this, I've gone, I've gone through a listing yeah. of all the bills that have been passed and how the illegal immigration population has just continued to increase. These bills haven't worked. Senator Feingold's, what he was proposed, wouldn't work. I'm going to have to wrap it up there to make sure you get the time for the closing statements here. It is that time of the evening, and we have flipped a coin to determine the order, and we begin with Senator Johnson. Senator. You know, I first ran in 2010 because I was panicked for this nation, and I made two basic promises. I'll always tell you the truth, and I'll never vote my reelection in mind. I've honored those promises. I'm not running because I want to be a U.S. Senator. I'm not running because I want to be somebody. I'm running because I understand this nation faces enormous challenges and we need people coming from the private sector, having the perspective of accomplishing something in life. That's why I'm doing this. And so the fact of the matter is, as Chairman of Homeland Security, I put myself in a position to actually accomplish something. Again, 83 pieces of legislation. 28 have been signed to law. I'm doing exactly what folks in Wisconsin, as I've traveled around, have asked. Can't you guys get along and do something? So the fact of the matter is, I want to solve these problems. I'm asking for your support. I'm asking you for a vote. This will be my last term. I'll never vote my re-election mine because I'll never stand for re-election again. I don't know how many times Senator Feingold is going to run for re-election. Thank you, Senator Johnson. And now we'll hear from Mr. Feingold. Thank you, Mike. I have so enjoyed uh, getting around the state and, and seeing the exciting innovations, uh, things like urban evolutions in Appleton, where they take uh, down barns, and they take gym floors from schools and turn them into beautiful home appliances. And frankly, I thought it was important that I visit six or seven of these craft breweries around the state, uh, as well as a vodka distillery in Sirona, Wisconsin, that is excellent samples. So this is a great part of this great state, and you have to be positive about the future. But unfortunately, I've heard great concern from people that they're not able to make ends meet. People at the top are doing great, but they're not doing so well. And that's because people like Senator Johnson vote against their interests. They vote against the minimum wage increases. They vote against family leave. They don't do anything about the student loan pro program. You deserve a senator who will stand with you. And if I'm elected, that's exactly what I'll do. So I ask you for your vote. 
Thank you, Mr. Feingold. And with that, our time is up tonight. We do want to take, uh, thank the candidates uh, for being here. Thanks to Senator Johnson and to Mr. Feingold for joining us today. Also want to thank all the folks at home for watching and the people in this audience tonight. We would also like to acknowledge our editorial partner, WISPolitics.com and the Upfront Network of Stations carrying tonight's broadcast live. And a reminder, please get out and vote on November 8th. For WISN-TV and Marquette University Law School, I'm Mike Goucher. Have a great night.